Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about replicas, surrogates, and digitization. I'm Jenna Thyerson, an objects conservative based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservative based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservative based in Cambridgeshire. Right, so today we're trying to cover a couple of different things that we thought were roughly related. So I think that a good place to start would be talking about why things are copied. Why do we have non-original objects in museum collections or in, Mm, in museum displays? And I think for several reasons, better communication to an audience, sort of facilitating a different object use through different types of engagement. So tactile learning, handling type things preventing damage through over intervention is another thing I've got written down. So, you know, in, instead of totally repainting this bit of fill and recoloring and stuff, you could do it on a computer. No, I, I, I particularly agree because handling objects can be replicas. I, I'm in favor of having handling objects that are real objects as well, by which I mean something yeah. that's actually old, making it into a handling collection. I think that's equally valid, but sometimes you can't because something's too fragile or it's been repaired too many times or something's actively dangerous if it's the real thing or, you know, there are loads of valid uses for having replicas in in particularly handling collections and teaching situations. And I definitely agree that we also need them for things like touch, touch tours and things like that to increase access for partially sighted people, for example. But again, you know, you, you you'd also want original object in there so depends on what you're doing I guess and what the object is I think an interesting case also is the opposite of what you said Jenny so instead of having a replica for handling is having it it are the collections where there are replicas but they are museum objects they're accessioned objects Mm. um, although they're not original in some sense and so they're very much not for handling they're treated the same way as the other original objects if you like so I'm thinking here um, I I spoke to uh, Suzanne Turner who's the curator of the Museum of Classical Archaeology in Cambridge which has a large cast gallery so it's a gallery of plaster casts of classical sculptures and they in some cases they're a couple of hundred years old they're very fragile they are real objects Mm. um, but they're very much not there as kind of sacrificial replicas for handling to protect the real objects because apart from anything else apart from anything else the museum doesn't actually have the original Um, and that's another kind of use of replicas is that these casts were made in large numbers and museums all over the place bought them because they couldn't have the original sculpture but it was it served an educational purpose Um, it allowed them to have all of these famous things in their collection that they wouldn't otherwise have yeah and that's an interesting one because of course you could start questioning when something is a copy for example so if someone's after an artist's death has made a copy of uh, a bronze statue that's also a bronze statue Mm. is does that count as an original object or is that actually a replica of the original object uh, that's then become part of another museum's collection etc so it's it becomes this interesting conversation about what's authentic and what we count (laughs) as real uh, and it becomes very very philosophical which is really interesting when you think about it also when is a replica a fake yeah oh i think when you lie yes isn't a replica fake (laughs) as soon as you pretend it's not a replica as soon as it becomes deceit i think but then does the absence of communication about its status as a replica count as deceit also i'd argue yes if you put a nice statue in a museum and you don't tell me that it's a replica and i think it's the real thing that michelangelo made like a really long time ago then i think you are lying and deceiving What about restoration of objects then, where you are, you could be said to be replicating areas? Oh, yeah. And often museums, very, very often, in fact, most of the time, it's usual that museums don't make it explicit what parts of an object have been restored. So you could argue that that is also deceitful. Oh, that's an But I don't think anybody would say that's fakery apart from the most ardent (laughs) anti-restoration people ever. And I think there are some, but I I think they would very much be in a minority. I think most people would agree that that kind of restoration, um, sympathetic restoration, if 
if you like, mm. does allow some kind of visual integration of the object and enables it to be better understood and interpreted and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you, you know, yeah, we, all, yeah. we all know these but arguments. I, I guess the distinction there is perhaps possibly the amount of intervention, because I guess if, I've, if I'm thinking something has been restored to look whole again, then that it can be a substantial amount of the object. But at the same time, I'm not thinking it's the entire object. Like you wouldn't have a toe of a of a statue and then build the rest of the statue that would be extremely <laughs> rare to go that far and then then we're more yeah that then we've strayed into different weird territory where it stops being restoration and it starts being fake kind of but even then only kind of but i guess it's also about what you what you're aiming to get out of it because for example fakes aim to pass as the real thing they usually aim to make money as where a, a replica doesn't necessarily it's, it tends to be more educational than that yeah philosophy eh <laughs> And this is interesting uh, in terms of also displaying copies of photographs. And I know that particularly the uh, I've heard of the John Rylands Library in Manchester doing this and also in some cases People's History Museum displaying framed photographs that are copies of either documents that they have in their collections or documents that they have had permission to copy from other institutions or private individuals. And in that respect, I think they are, it's always communicated that they are copies. And Hmm. particularly in the case of the John Rylands Library, this is done because of the issues of fading, photographs fading, being a whole can of worms. And it just frankly just being, yeah. why would you, why would you need to display the photograph if you could display a copy but well, then that's another argument of yeah but then it's a similar thing for example some museums uh if they can't control the amount of light that comes under a gallery they yeah. will display prints that they have made so reproductions they have made of some of their paintings which i think is completely fine because you can replace the prints as many times as you need if it's completely uncontrollable and that's better than sacrificing the actual painting yeah. uh, as long as you make people aware this is a print of a painting that we can't display because of these reasons Mm -hmm. yeah and then does that change whether it oh god this is getting complicated does that change whether it's a (laughs) painting is that different to if it's a printed photograph Mm. i mean i guess you could go the kind of british museum route here which is we have this this on display if you want to come see the real thing make an appointment and you can see the real thing if you if the brush strokes and the composition is really important to you come and see us and we'll bring it to you oh i see yeah Uh, i mean you could you could do that because i know someone who's done that to japanese wood block printing and stuff like that like Mm. um they went and see the real thing because they were fragile and not on display as such okay mm. i know an example of the people's history museum they've um they've copied and they've taken a, a, a copy of a paper object um in order to s- display it because it was in poor condition and they wouldn't have been able to display it otherwise and it's been enlarged quite a lot i assume to fit in with the with the display and the curatorial or do you think it's to make it more legible or potentially yeah. yeah, I mean, but there are these options that you do have when yeah. you make a copy, much like if someone 3D scans an object and then opts to have it 3D printed or otherwise replicated, then you could, of course, enlarge it and make a larger version of something to draw attention to details, for example, like manufacturing or tool marks or similar. You, you can play with that in a way that you can't with a real object. So it does bring different possibilities along, which, you know, can be very useful in terms of educational stuff. Yeah. In this respect, I think I, I don't want to talk about this very much because it's extremely boring. Um, <laughs> but issues of copyright oh. come into play, particularly with more contemporary collections. Can you take copies of somebody else's work and display them? Ooh, I know in some okay. cases I know of of displayed copies that are only allowed to be displayed for one particular exhibition yeah, and so then destroy actively they've got to be destroyed this is an interesting one and this is kind of where i feel like we all once need a registrar to join us <laughs> yes they, please they registrar will have opinions, a, please. a really good handle on how these things work because different museums have different licensing agreements so um and sometimes those have been drawn up in in um, consultation with the artists whose work it is and sometimes when that hasn't been possible it could have been uh, drawn up with their estate or their descendants or similar so there it's it's complicated it's the answer it's uh, <laughs> uh i think it's a case-by-case case basis where, yeah you know 
something might work for something but not for another thing i suppose i i was thinking about one of the most common uses of replicas in museums which is for display where uh, the some so some of the examples you mentioned were using replicas for display where the original object is deemed too fragile to go on display yeah. long term and then i was wondering well if that's the case why do we have any real objects in museums? Because, yeah. I mean, they'd almost all be better off in storage rather than uh, on display, obviously. And if a replica is an OK substitute, as it clearly is deemed to be in the case in the cases where it's used, then why not do it for all objects? And then people get to see the objects. They get to see anything in a collection. There are no limitations. And um, at the same time, all the objects can be safe in a dark and cool store, uh, aging far less rapidly than they would be otherwise. Oh, that doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> no, yeah, well, I know, I know you're playing devil's advocate. And the uh, conservation brain goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, but the utilitarian in me says, no. How dare you? <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think in terms of even just the idea of displaying all of a photographic collection as replicas makes me feel a little sad. Like I think the conservator obviously is saying, yeah, of course, that's how we want to do it. We want to preserve it, blah blah blah. But it it makes me feel a little bit sad because obviously we are the guardians of material culture for the future why is the future not now we need to just you know mm, the, yeah. the, what, what's the purpose of this stuff if we aren't displaying it so that's in that respect i feel a little bit uncomfortable with with the idea of taking copies of things and as you say displaying using copies to display things that we would rather not put on display for me in terms of taking copies of flat works i think it has to be almost an exception so solving problems and mm. putting it on display despite the problems that the actual object is causing um so it's a it's a way of increasing access where the alternative might be displaying well not displaying it yeah uh, i guess it's also for me i guess it's the value of something being real and i know that we're now being very philosophical when we're trying to define what's real <laughs> everything exists but <laughs> i was more thinking there's a special power in seeing something that is old and there's a special connection to the past by looking at you know including paper and photographs and paintings you know like it doesn't have to be three-dimensional at something that someone has genuinely made or something that someone's genuinely written seeing ink on paper that is being put there by an actual pen it can be very powerful. And I think we, we mustn't be tempted to take that away from humans because it's part of the human experience. So that so-called aura, I mean, it's often talked about as the aura of an mm. object, is very well attested. And there's been a lot of studies to show that people have less satisfactory experiences when they're handling what they know to be replicas than when they're handling what they know to be real objects, which raises a whole other can of worms. So, you know, in your handling <laughs> session, should you give people replicas and tell them that they're real objects so they get the best possible experience and yet the objects are damaged the least? Probably not. That's not very ethical. But, <laughs> ah, 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 I, um, I have a story. And that is part of uh, our handling kit where I work now. Uh, part of the Egyptian objects there are real objects and there are also some that we know are fake as in they are not ancient Egyptian but they were still made 200 years ago so then we get to have that conversation with visitors who are handling these so what if I told you that what you're holding is a fake how do you feel about it now and usually they're dismayed or that sort of thing and I said well how about if I tell you it's 200 years old and they're like oh so it's it's not fake it is fake but it's a fake that's old so does that does that change how you feel about it can you can you think of a story that goes with it like under what circumstances would this have been made so it's creating narrative even about the fake things that can really actually enhance uh, an, ex an experience like that so yeah it's it's a tricky one to navigate whether or not we let people handle replicas or not but sometimes it can be the context of the replicas that's really interesting it's the story thing isn't it though mm. i think I, i've done similar handling collection uh, events as well myself and the question from members of the public does always tend to be this is amazing where's it from mm. or do how did you how did you get it or how old is it and if you are as some museums do using a collection that is specifically handling and as such you don't have the same kind of information yeah. and knowledge Often around it then it's a bit it's a bit disappointing to say oh we we don't know 
you know oh, yeah. I don't, yeah it's a really amazing horn whatever we don't know where it's from we have no idea it, it, it is sometimes the runt of the litter that kind of ends up in the handling collection <laughs> and that is kind of unfortunate when you're trying to build stories around it i mean i i, sh- I should be clear yes as chloe said I, I was slightly being a devil's advocate i don't believe for a moment that all objects should be kept in a darkened store all the time and that we should just have museums full of replicas but i do think it's interesting to consider this if only as a thought experiment so that you can try and get to the bottom of what it is that is valuable about a real object that is lost when a replica is on display. Mm. So is it something to do with the physicality of the object or is it something to do with this aura of originality and authenticity? Um, Or what is it? I mean, what if you could have an absolutely faithful replica that replicated the original in absolutely every degree? So, I mean, I think I think most people would agree that replicas that are poorly made or that don't adequately reflect the original materials and textures and and, uh, weight and so on. Those those are inadequate. That's fine. I mean, nobody would say that it would be satisfactory to put a plastic suit of armor on display instead of your real thing. Yeah. Um, But you know what what uh, we're we're in an age now where it's possible to get more and more ap- accurate reproductions of things and also where it's possible to make things that look very much like other things and so then that argument about oh well it's not satisfactory because it doesn't look like the real thing or it hasn't got the same amount of detail or whatever is slightly undercut yeah i mean in some ways i feel like i feel like replicas belong in the expensive museum shop <laughs> Uh, where it's like well if you want to bring something home that's very similar you, you can have this as far as possible i'd love to see if we used our actual objects in our collections um i, I this only this morning i did see a link from the british museum mm-hmm. advertising i think it was a pendant of an object that they didn't actually have in their collection um but it was a, a replica of an object in a different collection mm-hmm. selling in the in British Museum shop for 150 pounds and i don't know obviously you know sell what you like i don't care but <laughs> I, I don't i think in terms of owning something you know liking something and being able to own it as a museum visitor is super great if you want but if it's not from the same collection as the shop you bought it from is that does that change the relationship like if you didn't see I, it in the sh- in the museum okay, and I then feel take like it home yes. from but the then shop. Uh, I, I have to take off my uh, museum professional hat and go as a regular museum visitor i love seeing th- replicas from the actual museum collection yeah in the shop that is the stuff to die for <laughs> it's when it's west uh whatever they're called the reproduction company that does like a lot of like little tiny roman things and like that sort of thing mm. and they're in every single every single museum yes. shop then i'm less bothered because it's not unique then yeah uh it's very much a thing that you, you can pick up a fake talk anywhere and you, <laughs> you know you can you can get one of those tiny adorable little uh, pencil sharpeners that you know is actually a uh, trebuchet uh you know <laughs> oh you, you, you you can you can get them everywhere and there's nothing independently wrong with that. It's, it just means that it's less tempting to me because I want the unique thing, even though I could never afford the unique thing. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I guess I do appreciate when it's something unique to the place I'm visiting. But then I feel that way about postcards and pencils as well. So um, talking of museum shops, um, I was on a bus last week um, going to work and happened to bump into Dan Pemberton, who works at the Sedgwick Museum of Geology in Cambridge. And we got chatting, as you do, about uh, 3D printing and laser scanning and stuff. And he told me about a really fun project that he'd done recently, which was uh, involved a different kind of replica. Well, I'm on a bus talking to... Dan Pemberton from the Cedric Museum. That's all right. Yep. That's me. Um, and uh, we were talking about a. Um, that was a bit of fun, really, wasn't it? For, yeah. Uh, for a summer party. Yeah, and we were talking about replicas and so on. And it turns yeah. out you've made some museum replicas of a very sweet kind. Yeah. Um, so we've been working on a, a virtual collections project on a, a 17th century uh, fossil collection, which left us with a lot of um, uh, 3D models of, uh, of fossils. So uh, the uh, University of Cambridge Museum's uh, sort of uh, summer party bake-off theme this year was collections. So I thought it might be quite nice to uh, to make a, a chocolate virtual collection, uh, seeing as kind of like the, the theme of our project. 
So started off with um, some 3D models that we'd created from uh, photogrammetry and laser scanning. Then what we did with those was um, rescaled them uh, to a sort of small chocolate size. Uh, 3D printed them in uh, PLA on our 3D printer. And then uh, I sort of took them home and uh, looked into how to make some, some silicone moulds. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a food-grade silicone, because obviously you don't want to poison the people <laughs> eating your chocolates. Um, the only one I could find um, that was easily accessible was a, a, a platinum catalyzed um, silicone oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. and the, uh, the problem with those is that um, uh, many things interfere with the uh, catalysis so uh, you can put your object into the liquid silicone and it won't cure mm -hmm. if you're not very careful with the materials you use so I had to do a bit of fiddling around some trials to make sure that, that the moulding process would work so um, because um, uh, using sort of uh, FDM type 3D printers you end up with kind of like um, contour lines on your yeah. prints I kind of tried to obliterate that by uh, I painted them with um, I actually used um, uh, gum arabic because yep. I thought that also probably wouldn't be toxic either Yes. Um, but also I sort of hoped that that might stop anything in the uh, print medium interfering with the cure of the silicone so sure. that seemed to work alright uh, so I made silicone moulds uh, and then uh, made uh, uh, chocolate which you have to sort of melt down and then uh, mm -hmm. temper properly uh, and sort of spoon into the moulds and then you just wait for them to to uh, harden and that's it and so how did you do in the bake-off uh, competition we did win a prize fantastic what was it for <laughs> being a nerd <laughs> How did they taste? <laughs> oh, very good. I was very impressed. I sort of um, had a bit of experimenting blending. Uh, so I started with milk chocolate and then added sort of various yeah. degrees of plain chocolate. Yep. Because I prefer a sort of bitterer, less sweet chocolate. Yeah. So I did quite a bit of fiddling around with chocolate blends as well. And then we put them onto, uh, uh, for, the, for the competition, we put them onto cupcakes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that were made by uh, uh, Sandra Freshney, uh, museum's archivist. Okay. And they were really awesome, actually. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking to us. No, that's all right. I hope it's uh, <laughs> helpful in some way. No. Oh, that's so excellent. I, to, oh, I, do. I want to hear all yeah. of those for, things. And first of all, I love that there's a bake-off. I knew about it already, but I do love it. Museum bake-off has to be <laughs> more of a thing out there. If anyone else does a museum bake-off, please tell me. <laughs> they take it exceedingly seriously. They I do. Think that's, I mean, obviously... Ha hang on, we participated one year and we made gingerbread conservators we did with so lab well. coats and little gloves yes so uh, bake off is a serious business <laughs> it's really but i mean museums and cake have very close links it seemed to me i've never been in a museum that didn't take cake very very seriously yes, so true. Um, i would have thought that a museum bake off would be the natural that is true uh, evolution and sometimes of and sometimes on twitter you do see amazing cakes being presented in museum settings like um, oh, there was some great excavation cake I saw recently, which had you know like oh, bones wow. coming out of the internal layers, and I was like, "This is amazing." I think <laughs> I think it, it goes with a particular kind of museum, and that's another kind of replica, actually, isn't it? But I was going to say yeah, it cool. goes with a particular kind of museum nerdery, that kind of extreme attention to detail, but also the willingness to put loads and loads of effort into something that's awesome. ultimately quite ephemeral, quite. I, I was amazed. Stupid. <laughs> I was frankly genuinely <laughs> impressed with the um, attention to detail and general knowledge of material science and application of material science. Like what is toxic? What isn't toxic? It's. I'm. I'm pretty impressed. Oh, I think yeah. that's. I'm, I it's was good stuff. Yeah. Oh God, I'm telling facts <laughs> I mean, you, you, to Bake Offs. That's great. You would hope that he would pay attention to toxicity if people are going to be eating this but yeah well, yeah, yeah um, absolutely but it's not you know i suppose that it starts the problem starts where it's not the kind of thing that people would consider straight up <laughs> um so as soon as you start making something unusual you have to start thinking in unusual ways <laughs>
Hey, well, I have a question, and that is, what is the difference between a replicate and a surrogate? Because I feel like my language skills are failing me here, and I feel like I'm not entirely clear on what the difference is. My assumption would be that a surrogate does not replicate the original in every way, whereas a replica does. So I think you could have a surrogate that serves the same purpose, that works as a functional replica, but isn't an exact physical replica. Okay. Yeah, that's how I read it as well. So, for example, a surrogate of a document could actually be the words in the document typed up, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have a manuscript or whatever, you could type the text and just give it to someone in a Word file. Every time they want to consult this manuscript, you just go, okay, here's the text. Now Mm -hmm. you can read it. And that would function perfectly well as a surrogate for that text for that manuscript but an actual replica would be replicating all of the physical detail of it as well it might just be a high quality photograph it probably would just be a high quality photograph but it it would kind of have all the kind of physical trappings as well that go with it not just the functional ones i think I, I, I can totally buy that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank, thank you for helping me clear that up. And I suppose if you were in a museum of industrial history and there was an engine and then, sorry, an engine, you could have a surrogate engine that is doing the same kind of process, but not actually necessarily the, the same form. It's just, It would just yeah. potentially yeah, work in sense. the same yeah. way or produce power in the same way. So near to um, where I live, there's a National Trust property, which has a very famous chiming clock. And they were very concerned oh, yes, about... I remember the- hearing about this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> they um, were very concerned about the wear and tear on the mechanism caused by having this thing chiming um, on the hour. It had a very elaborate chime and also all kinds of exciting mechanical things happened um, as well when it was striking. And they decided in the end to save the wear and tear on the moving parts by making a very, very high quality digital recording of the chime Mm. and playing that. And I would say that that's a very good kind of surrogate for the chime. It's doing the same job um, and the clock still strikes and you can hear it. And what you're hearing is the actual clock. It's it's the same content, if you like, but it's just in a different form now. Instead of the sound coming from the physical action of the clock, you've got a high quality recording of it instead. So, I like that. Uh, so a little bit like emulating games on Raspberry Pi then in that. So- exactly like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I think I've mentioned before that I did a big project with some lead seals, uh, yeah. detached lead seals in an institution. And among the seals, there were a large number of electrotyped replicas. So electrotyping is a way of making um, metal replica of an object you kind of cast the object and then cover the mold with graphite powder and use electrolytic techniques to basically deposit a layer of metal over the over the surface of the mold so you end up with a very thin hollow shell that's exactly like the outside of your object and usually they fill that shell so in the case of these seals um, the electrotypes are made from copper or copper alloy of some sort then filled with lead so you have these kind of like coin shaped things and then in some cases we have the original seal plus an electrotype that was made in the at the end of the 19th century and the electrotype was significantly less corroded by the time I looked at them like 15 years ago whenever than the original lead seal was so actually the electrotype did a fantastic job of showing you what this object looked like a hundred years ago and what it no longer looked like now because it was now just like a heap of gray powder or you know that it was exploding with all of this yeah. voluminous white lead corrosion and so on and these are things which were kind of originally made for study and probably not considered very important but which have now got an immense value because they show all kinds of details that have been lost from the original object and which we can't get back yeah and so they now need to be conserved in themselves because they're still really valuable yeah Yeah. that's amazing and it's they act then do they as as examples of how lead of lead corrosion affects surface features but this also i mean this also ties into the cast that we were talking about earlier because sometimes yeah, totally. the the original statues have been lost since and these casts yes. may in fact be the last <laughs> oh remaining yeah. version of any of that and that's it's really interesting that it does actually serve a purpose as the, la- the last survivor of a of an object 
in a way. Yeah, and so that's the purpose. cherish your replicas, guys. Yeah, yes. yeah keep them. Yeah. And that's the purpose of Cherish your replicas, don't throw them out. Yeah. And that's the purpose of digitization in that case, isn't it? That that it's sort of saving things. Yeah, it, it kind of is, yeah. So it's you usually get with when I think digitization, I think access projects, you know, like these little yeah. funding pots that, you know, see you see them crop up every now and then, hey, we need a paper conservator to do a digitization project and that sort of thing. And it is usually heavily tied into it. We want the public to be able to access these things and view them online as opposed to have to come to us and root through a box for five <laughs> hours to find the piece of paper they want. There are some cases where digitization is also used so that a museum can deaccession objects um, and they can justify doing that because they have the digital replica. So I'm thinking of oh, newspaper <laughs> collections. Oh, well, okay, okay. But then uh, okay, with newspaper. Newspaper, <laughs> newspaper is often printed on very, very cheap yeah. paper that becomes very acidic and it goes very yellow and brittle. Yeah. And often these things can't reasonably be consulted by people because they're just too fragile and crappy mm. and also a lot of libraries and archives have issues with newspaper storage they feel obliged to keep a complete record of whatever local paper but in practice no one ever reads it because nobody wants to <laughs> but they keep it because it's the only complete archive of the yeah. whatsoever gazette um but digitizing these things is often seen as a way to keep the content it's this split between form and content again, I guess, and then get rid of all your crappy yellowing newspapers because nobody really cares about the physical object with a local newspaper necessarily. They just want to know what happened, have a look at the photos, read the stories and so on. Or at least that's that's the justification. But I'm interested that you 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 described that as naughty. <laughs> well, I think I think because I I think I always find it worry worrisome when someone takes a photo of something, for example, and says, that's good enough. We can get rid of that now. But I guess this, this is a very different set of rules. Like you said, there are genuine preservation issues with newspaper in particular. And for example, everyone is forced to rationalize their collections. That includes archives oh. and there just isn't the space to actually keep every single newspaper that a, a local paper has produced since the 1930s that like it's it's not actually viable um, no. unless you have massive resources and that's kind of rare so i think with newspapers it's possibly a bit different as well because they're mass produced objects and mm, so yeah. people are able to be a bit more kind of cut and dried about this split between content and form and say, well, the important thing is the content, but nobody cares about the form because it's just a mass produced bit of printing. You know, nobody feels any particular attachment to the maker there because the maker is some giant printing press. Yes, I I don't want to see museums go down the route of let's 3D scan this object that we have and then let's just get rid of the object because we have a scan of it. Why not? You know, someone can look at the scan and that'll be good enough. No, you're missing the point. I have to say, though, and this is specifically, I'm using this example because it's specific to newspapers. I, in the last couple of weeks, had to remove some adhesive tape, which had been naughtily just stuck all over a newspaper from 1992, I believe. And I was removing it this uh, because it was part of the collection. And though it's a newspaper, though I remember 1992, so it's within my own personal history, It does. it's not a historical object to me, I still felt that it was a marvellous object because of the differences that I could see and that struck me. So, for example, particularly because the page that I was removing this stuff from was page three and it was the sun. Um, ah. <laughs> so there was an extremely dated photograph of a beautiful woman. Um, <laughs> And the, the fact that it was so dated was, it really, it struck me that the differences and the, 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 the kind of snapshot in history that that provided, I felt, I felt really sort of, I kind of thought it was brilliant. And I wonder if it, there's a huge difference between digitization of an archive of a newspaper where you, the alternative would be to just, just to store thousands and thousands of <laughs> issues of a newspaper and keeping one offs as yeah. examples of the time, whether the difference is there. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Because it's, I think oh, it's, it's tricky because paper ephemera is, is a kind of a unique thing unto itself. 
And newspapers can be seen as that. I mean, for example, I know people who have kept the newspaper from the day that their first child was born, for example, because they just want to show Aww. them, like, you know, when they're older, like, this is what happened on the day you were born. And it's like, oh, God, you I could, bet no one does that anymore. No, you could, this year. <laughs> let's be fair, you could look that up online now. But you know, at the same time, it's the bit of ephemera that's special to them. So, I mean, yeah, oh, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? But basically, I guess I see digitization as a good thing because it does increase increase access mm-hmm. um, yeah. it it does help research and collaboration and sometimes people from very far away can find something in your local history collection that is actually relevant to them and that makes them allows them to make a connection that they didn't think was possible between two very different geographical locations or two different collections or you know it, it has enormous potential i guess i guess my only thing is it shouldn't mean that the risk of neglect is bigger for the objects like it's it's not that you done looking after say a photographic collection just because you scan them i and put them online like you're not done you still have to look after them i guess that's that's kind of where i'm at and you can't get rid of them yeah 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 like it's still valid to look after them we've been talking about the physicality of these objects and Mm. about how you miss having a physical object when you have a digitized uh, replica but i'm thinking also about the actual material you know you were saying oh you could just 3d scan these things and so on but of course what would be missing there would be the actual materials yeah. that the objects are made from the wood the metal the pigments the the plaster the organic materials and stuff like that and um, we often study those and get loads and loads of information out of them yeah. and that's information that would no longer be possible i mean technical art history is a whole field in itself oh, and yeah. people have found out incredible things about paintings that go way beyond the immediate circumstances they were painted in. You know, people have found out all sorts of things about the trade of pigments and about yeah. uh, manufacturing techniques and, and relative status and all that kind of thing. Artists' methods, so it's been used to authenticate things and so on. And that's something that would be lost if we didn't have the actual physical objects, no matter how good a digitized replica is. Yeah, definitely. And I also feel a th- good 3D scan or a 3D printed replica of something or a really detailed video, you know, like a 360 kind of thing of the entire object mm. and detailed photographs, they complement the object. They don't replace it. They complement it and they can add something. But it's not that they replace the object is ultimately, like you say, it's still vital to have it. And I think those are often used most successfully for interpretation rather than for conservation reasons. I'm thinking about all of these sort of exciting things that people are doing now with VR in museums yeah. um, or, or, or with um, historic sites where you can go and you can get an app that allows you to see what this kind of dilapidated ruin would have looked like when it yeah. was... Um, first built and you could see all the whole building and and that kind of thing and that kind of thing's immensely useful i think from an interpretation point of view yeah no absolutely uh they are absolutely brilliant and obviously i mean when we're thinking of things like scanning of stonehenge i mean they found two marks that they hadn't been able to visibly see with the naked eye before because they were mm-hmm. they were investigating these things so i mean of course they have an enormous value but i think it, you have to see it all as a whole think where yeah it, it all adds to a bigger picture it's i mean obviously i don't mean to be <laughs> one of those people who says everything's going to be a disaster but it does protect against disaster having photographs and 3d scans and general copies oh, studies yeah. of these things particularly for things like fo- fading photographs and i suppose cellulose nitrate film yeah, um, but I mean, it's also it's going to deteriorate if you have a 3D copy of what is on the film. Yeah, then I mean, it, it doesn't guards, matter quite so much. Safeguards in many ways. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you know, all objects can be lost to fire or war or all sorts of things, really. And uh, you know, if there's something left over, then that is obviously better than nothing. So you know, but yeah. So again, uh, I think it just all needs to come together as a holistic thing and not be like, "Hey, we scanned this object. Let's bin it now." <laughs> you know, that's not cool. So I'm here today at the British Library and I'm here with Jessica Pollard. Jessica, could you tell us a bit about what you do? Hello. Um, Well, I'm a digitisation conservator. I've been here since last June and um, my role is very varied. Um, I'm part funded um, by the Polonsky Foundation. So that's working on one specific digitisation project. 
Ooh. And that's very nice. It's working on, we're digitising um, 400 pre-1200 manuscripts. Whoa, that's old. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're old. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're trying to make 400 manuscripts um, available online. And that's in collaboration with the um, National Library of France. So they're doing 400 and we're doing 400. Oh, so teamwork. Eight, yep, 800 manuscripts will be available online. Wow. So yeah, that's half my job. Wow. And the rest of my time is just working on any digital project that comes up. And uh, what, what sort of thing can that well, be? Yeah, that can range from, you know, one manuscript that is needed tomorrow. Maybe a reader has requested okay, yeah. images. Um, or it can be a curator suddenly found some money in their budget to digitise 3,000 papyri fragments. And that, again, might be... You know, it could be needed to be done by the next couple of months or it might be next year. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's very busy. And, yeah, it's very busy just because sometimes people just don't know when they have funding. No, they can no. suddenly get funding and it needs to be spent, you know, tomorrow. Obviously, there is planning involved. Obviously, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there can be surprises. But yeah, there can be surprises. So, yeah, it's just all about flexibility. <laughs> oh, that good old word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the most overused word in conservation, yeah. I think. <laughs> But important. <laughs> but important, yes, that's true. Mm. Um, how did you come to work as a digitisation conservator? How did you end up here? I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, I didn't um, look for it to begin with. It was um, coming out of university, um, yeah, looking for a job, you know yeah. what it's like. And um, digitisation projects, I think because, you know, access is such an important word in museums, libraries, archives. Um, that's where lots of the funding goes. It goes into digitisation projects, so there are lots of them around. Yeah. So, yeah, I just got onto one of them. I started at the National Archives in their digitisation oh, nice. department. And it's a great chance, especially when you first in, finish university, because you get to see so much of the collection. And so you get to see so many different materials um, in a short space of time. Yeah. And especially when you first come out of university, obviously you've had a whole year to work on one object. Which yeah. Is, you know, a luxury that's no, never repeated. <laughs> um, it's a really good opportunity, especially as a new conservator, to learn about time management, project management, yeah. um, deadlines, scheduling, as well as working with yeah, so many different people. You have to work with curators, the photographers. Um. So yeah, from that, I then um, worked to the Royal London Hospital Archives for a while, again on a digitisation project, um, Yeah, before coming here last July. Nice. Yeah. Oh, wow, excellent. Well, in that case, you've got ample experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, lis- for listeners who aren't familiar with digitisation, could you maybe take us through the typical process yeah of course it's um i mean it is project dependent but um normally um for the conservator i just get given a list normally of objects their shelf marks sometimes a general description of what i might be looking at and then again project dependent um you normally get given like a bit of brief about the project like deadlines um if there's any budget for conservation um so then uh, the next step is the condition assessment um and i'll go into the storerooms and it's generally a page by page um condition assessment wow so quite time consuming presumably it is time consuming um i mean you get a feel for things yeah you know sometimes you can look at manuscript and you can tell the whole thing is in a really really good condition yeah. so it can be a lot quicker but yeah generally it's page by page um we produce a condition assessment um it's generally quite brief you know, it's not the same as a, for a full conservation treatment. And then, yeah, we send that to all the relevant people. So that includes the curator, um, the head of imaging services, Gail, my project manager. Yeah, so then the next step is, depending on time and budget, um, is the actual conservation treatment. And that can be anything from a small tear repair to, you know, conservation of bindings, um, rehousing. So it can be pretty extensive if... Yeah, because, I mean, often I think with digitisation, you do think of, you know, minimal, minimal intervention. Yeah, no, and it, quite. That's, and it, that's what I've got in my head. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it often is. Um, yeah. You know, it has to be safe for handling. Yeah. But it still has to withstand the, the handling. And often it can be handled by a cataloguer, well, the conservator, a cataloguer, the photographers. And if there's post checks, the conservator again. So you do have to think about longevity. So, yeah, when you say, yeah, minimal, I mean, what is minimal intervention? Well, anyway, not quite. Yeah, other, oh, God, but, um, yes. <sighs> but this is, yeah, minimal for the safe handling of it and depending on the state of the object it could be still quite intensive so yeah there's the conservation and then obviously we're always around for the photographers if they need any assistance with handling some items don't need any conservation but might be particularly large or just difficult to handle so yeah we're always around for that um i mean this is a stupid question i really ask that now but (laughs) 
now that I sit here in my ignorance, I'm like, <laughs> so I always imagine that things get scanned in rather than photographed, but I suppose that depends on what it is. Or yeah, it definitely depends on what it is. I mean, we do obviously have scanners and um, items that can withstand just the general scanning. I mean, it makes sense that he wouldn't put like a very precious book and just mush it out yeah. and put it in a scanner because nobody would do that. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, some scanners, you know, they're not all flat. They can no, be quite. scanners. So, um, so lots of things go through scanning. But no, lots of, I mean, all our manuscripts, our medieval manuscripts are always photographed. And then, yeah, we have so many different types of objects. We have um, oracle bones. We've got, yeah, the papyri that's housed in glass. We've got um, ostraca, you know, um, oh, yeah. fragments of yes. ceramics with writing on. So all those kind of things, yeah, they're all photographed. Um, I think there are over 10 photographers we have. Wow. Working in the digitization section. So, yeah, lots of things are photographed. And yeah, they always need assistance. You know, some, yeah, difficult with handling. There might be damages that we didn't notice during our condition assessment that come up. So yeah, we're always around. And then some, um, some of our special items need invigilating. So the photographer, because obviously the photographers normally work independently. But yeah, some of the special items always have to have either a conservator or a curator with them at all times. So that can just be sitting there watching while the photographers do their work. <laughs> um, but then you get to see the really nice yeah that's true the treasures yeah. which is always always a treat and yeah that's normally the end of the process um some projects require post checks so after photography you then have to go through the, man- the um, item again yeah. to check that it withstood imaging and then back in storage hey lovely but yeah. then but then it is digitized and then that yes. bit's done yes so presumably depending on what it is it goes online or yeah i am um, Again, like for what I mentioned earlier, like readers' requests, yeah. they often um, might just ask for a page or two, yes. um, and that just goes into our image bank and just stays there. Um, but no, most, especially all the projects, yeah, that's all about access. So it's, yeah, yeah all online for free. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but that is a lot of the projects that you do see, just like you said, uh, yeah. is, you know, increasing public access and yeah. getting people to actually see things, which yeah. is lovely. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Are there things that don't get digitised for some reason? Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, again, for access, you know, we don't want to say no. No. Um, We do want things to be out there and accessible. So we do try not to say no. But yeah, again, it's project dependent. I mean, some projects have no budget for conservation. And our studio only has a very small amount of time that we can um, give to conservation of digitisation if it's not externally funded. What else don't we... Or maybe like license and copyright Oh, issues. that makes sense. Yeah. Then we can't. But yeah, that's not our field. And actually, no, the other day I had, um, well, not the other day, the other week, we had, um, there's a Greek manuscript digitization project. And there was a, it's an item, it's just a huge, really large volume. And it's been very tightly bound. And you actually just can't get to the gutter. Of, and those of the text is lost. And um, it's, a com- well, a com- combination of the tight binding and just the distorted parchment. And for imaging, you wouldn't get half the text. No. So it would be, I mean, you could cause damage to the manuscript trying to open it too wide, yeah, and you just would, wouldn't be able to read it anyway. Um, so, yeah, something like that. I mean, you could obviously start thinking about disbinding. Yeah. Um, you know, the, if the binding is not original, there could be an argument for disbinding, because yeah. if you can't read the text with the image, you, yeah. you actually can't read a lot of the text, Yeah. you know. And then it becomes physical. Then it becomes a utility thing. Or what? What good is a book that you can't read? Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's a light. We're a working library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What's the point? And yeah, having a book you can't (laughs) read. Um, We didn't talk about disbinding in this um, particular item, but that is something that might be thought about. But no, I think that was the last. I mean, yeah, I've been there since last July, and I think I've only really said no to two items. So yeah, we always try and, you know, you just have to be pragmatic about it and just try and find a way. I mean, you work with the photographers a lot and you work with the imaging people a lot to just work out ways of, yeah, ways of doing things. What's the best thing about working with digitization? Because it's so varied and interesting. Like every day, someone will ask you to go check out something, you know, do a condition assessment on this and you never know what you're going to find. And it's normally amazing because, yeah, the collection is just so interesting and I get to see so much of it. I think as a traditional bench conservator obviously you still see these amazing things but I just feel like I see about a thousand times more (laughs) of it Um, and you just get I well I feel like I'm getting a really good overview of the collection you know you have you know what the medieval collection is going to be about you know it's going to be parchment illuminations some original bindings lots of rebindings but you know in the space of a year I've got to see 400 of them so I think I mean that's my favorite thing I think is just seeing it more as a yeah as a larger Mm. 
as a larger... No, kind of a bigger picture. Yeah, you do see the bigger picture. And just, yeah, the new challenges you get every day. Yeah. And working with different people. I mean, I think when you at university, you my idea of a conservator was on a little bench, kind of on your own, working away, talking to maybe one or two other conservators. And here, yeah, I get to meet new people every day. Yeah. No, I love it. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and I think because lots of funding is going into digitization, um, there's lots of opportunities as well. Like I was trained in um, paper conservation mm. and archival materials. Um, but through the British Library, I've been able to do a lot more like book binding and book conservation. And my last role at the Royal London Hospitals, um, I was given like 1,500 um, glass plate negatives wow. and asked to rehouse and digitize them. And I'd never been near glass plates negatives before um so yeah i think you get a steep learning curve and opportunities to do yeah a lot and learn a lot excellent (laughs) (laughs) what can conservators and other institutions do to help facilitate digitization efforts in-house do you think i think you have to be open to it just working with the different people is probably the most important thing um so you do know what the aim is like why are you doing it because i think it is a, sometimes it can be a bit of a buzzword for funding and people don't necessarily know what they're going to do with the images after or why they're digitizing it so i think as long as yeah you know what you're doing with it so a clear goal helps yeah i think a clear goal and yeah working with the other people but yeah being open to it and um i think being flexible again sorry that word um but it is very important it takes a lot more time and resources than you might think yeah, but so, I, I feel that's true with almost any project that anyone yeah, embarks oh, on. It's like, yeah. oh no, it took twice as long. <laughs> yeah, but I just think you have to, mm. if you can do it properly. Yes. But it's I, just I, I guess planning. I guess with digitization, it's a thing that loads of people have been going through or are going through. Yeah. And it's worth asking around, like, how long did this take you? How long did you mm. think it would take? And learn from other people's experiences yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. D- yeah. That, no, that's a really good point. Because you don't always know, and thing, things can be a lot more difficult to digitize than you realize and um, you know we might be handling things every day and think we know oh no that book's quite easy to open and then actually the photographer's doing it and they're finding it very difficult and it can take three days when you know they had been planned you budgeted for, for one of, yeah. yeah so yeah communication with the different people because everyone has yeah their own experiences that they can bring to it yeah well thanks very much for talking to us today jessica i really That's appreciate right. it my pleasure thank you Hello, my name is Suzanne Turner and I am curator at the Museum of Classical Archaeology in Cambridge. So our collection is, I suppose, a little bit odd because the public face of our collection is about 450 plaster casts of classical sculpture. So that's Greek and Roman sculpture on display in our cast gallery. And in total, I think we've got something nearer 650. So they're really kind of sizable objects. They're not little, small things that are just in drawers um and for the oldest ones in the collection we don't always know their full history because the earliest casts were donations to the Fitzwilliam Museum when it opened essentially and they came from private houses from large estates Mm -hmm. so they had a life before they became museum objects as it were but that's not always a terribly well documented life so why would people have made these casts Um, Well, originally, of course, plaster casts are being produced in a time before there's photography and you can easily just switch on the Internet and look at pictures of things from all sorts of different angles or these days moving pictures. Um, So originally they're a way of kind of disseminating particularly prized pieces of classical sculpture to elite audiences and fine art schools around the world because of course a sculpture can only be in one place but if you can make multiple copies of it it can exist in multiple places Um, and that's partly kind of capturing things as they're being discovered as well so very quickly particularly through the course of the 19th century plaster casts are being used to disseminate new archaeological discoveries so the Fitzwilliam Museum is getting casts of objects that are being discovered in Olympia for instance sometimes within six months of discovery and that's really fast because it can take a kind of master plaster cast craftsmen up to a year just to make the molds of a plaster cast to make like high quality molds so to be getting the molds made the cast made and it delivered in one piece within six months now that's fast (laughs) so by that time 
because the Fitzwilliam is open to everyone, provided you are appropriately dressed. Um, is that what they said? Yeah, it was in, in like the ordinances of, of the Fitzwilliam that anyone could come in, but you had to be appropriately dressed. Unless you're a cast of a classical sculpture, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so provided you're appropriately dressed, of course, once these things are in the Fitzwilliam, um, it becomes a way of disseminating those new discoveries to the masses, to the public, not just to um, aristocratic audiences putting their cultural capital on display in their own private residences. How late did the museum continue collecting these casts? Well, even recently. So um, we don't have much space now and plaster casts of classical sculpture are rather large. As anyone who's been to our collection would know, our largest um, piece is what, maybe five metres tall, the um, Samian Kuros. So we don't have that much space, so we don't collect things very often unless they get given to us for the most part. But we did more recently get a copy of the Terme Boxer, which is one of very few surviving bronzes from the ancient world. And so we had that bronzed up to make it look like it's original and the original has amazing kind of metallic polychromy so it has different alloys in the lips because he's just been in a fight so he's covered in like blood and wounds and things and they're oh, wow. all <laughs> everything is picked up in these beautiful alloys and we're terribly lucky to have it so we do occasionally get new pieces just not as often as we might like and are those new pieces that have been made recently or are they old casts that you've collected recently can be a bit of both so occasionally we'll get donations of kind of historical casts as it were so ones that have had their own life in someone's house or in several houses um but also there are still um cast workshops up and running particularly in europe so you can still purchase for a princely sum plaster casts for your own estate should you wish to so it is possible to buy new plaster casts I guess the difference is that these days it's much harder to get permission to make the molds yeah and so although modern molds tend to be made out of silicon and they say you know it does no damage at all to the original traditionally plaster cast molds were made out of plaster which of course is not terribly flexible and will stick itself essentially to the original so they can do damage to the surface um and so a lot of kind of plaster cast workshops are actually working from old molds or from newer molds taken from old molds so the most prized plaster casts are called original casts which is a totally ludicrous title it makes no sense but what it means is that the molds are taken directly from the original so they have that kind of moment of direct touch in the copying replication process Mm. and as time goes on those molds will tend to lose a little bit of their detail they get a bit fuzzy around the edges or they break and it becomes necessary to then make a new set of molds usually from a plaster cast from that original set so they kind of you get to the point where you're using kind of third or fourth generation molds so they lose a little bit of their clarity each time it's a bit like a photocopy of a photocopy so again that's something that you kind of see happening in the history of these workshops over the course of the 19th and into the 20th century by the time we're into the 20th century lots of the kind of major workshops are producing far lower quality casts than they would have been doing 50 years previously so it's a it's a mixed bag really in terms of what comes to us and what types of things are available on the market today mm-hmm. and you mentioned original casts mm-hmm. um, I, I'm thinking the ones that are the earliest casts might also show they might show the original objects at a much earlier stage in their lives as yeah. well and so they, they might well show features that have since been lost from the original Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, that's one of the things that is being increasingly recognised in research terms that, you know, um, plaster casts, bless their little hearts, haven't really fared very well in kind of academic opinion, as it were, because they're just copies, right? They don't really have much value. They're just secondary. But increasingly, I think there's more recognition that they can capture 
um, details about objects that might now be lost, like you say, kind of like freeze frame almost a moment in their history, although they then sort of accrue on their surface, their own history. Um, so I guess we've all kind of heard of like acid rain and damaging pieces in situ and things like that. But there's also cases, for instance, of objects that have been destroyed. For instance, we have a Niobe that was destroyed by a bomb. Mm. And my understanding is that a good original cast will differ by no more than 0.1 of a millimetre from its original. So, you know, there are changes that take place during the casting process, the most obvious being material. Plaster is never going to be marble and we can put as much paint on the surface as we want, but it's still not bronze, is it? (laughs) Um, There is a slight bit of shrinkage as it dries and things like that. But they are remarkably good at capturing the form and the space that the original occupies, for instance. And so they can capture very closely the previous lives of objects that have now been altered for one reason or another. I think one thing to note is that our kind of relationship with plaster casts today is not the same as the relationship that viewers and purchasers had or commissioners I suppose um, in the uh, say 19th century and that's because of the kind of very concept of authenticity itself wasn't one which particularly drove the making of plaster casts originally so and our own collection its own history is very much one in kind of microcosm um, of wider issues that are being played out in museums in that time period as museums begin to move away from kind of very eclectic displays or what we would now consider eclectic displays where all sorts of different things can be displayed as like kind of beside each other to greater classification and periodization as objects are separated out by their time period or the type of object that they are you know you get entire galleries don't you of um ceramic pots for instance mm-hmm. um and plaster cast didn't fare very well when that type of thing was happening because they didn't really fit where where do copies belong if you're ordering your galleries by the time period that the originals were made for instance mm-hmm. um and that's exactly the reason why we were founded they stopped fitting in in the fitzwilliam so the fitzwilliam created a separate museum to house the plaster casts um so we kind of see casts as very inauthentic but a viewer at the beginning of the 19th century might not have viewed them in quite the same way and might have seen them more on a par with their originals and that's partly because of the way in which particularly a fine art education privileged form over medium so plaster casts were able to embody the form of the original even if the medium was different does that make sense yeah totally so in a sense 3d printing might actually allow us to return in some ways or re-experience an earlier mode of viewing Mm -hmm. i guess um And the other thing to note, I suppose, is that there are collections today that now have gone back to displaying plaster casts alongside original objects. So, for instance, in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, when they redesigned their galleries, they incorporated plaster casts alongside original objects, which I think is just brilliant and awesome um, and allows them to tell richer stories as a result so you know you it allows them to mobilize objects that they don't actually have the original in their collection and that also goes for color because of course no we know now that much ancient sculpture was painted and one of the things that certainly within our collection and in many collections plaster casts allow us to do is to reimagine what these objects might have looked like with the paint surfaces that are now lost because ultimately no one's going to let you slap paint on a 2000 2500 year old object but you can do it to a plaster cast so you can create in fact multiple reimaginings um of what various ancient sculptures may have originally looked like Mm. so you were talking about how um, people don't think they have much value because they're just copies um 
you have a museum full of these things. Yeah. Do you, do you find that how how do visitors respond to them? Um, with confusion sometimes, and sometimes almost <laughs> with frustration. So we do get a lot of, well, where are the originals? Or you know, I mean, I spend half of my day each day sitting on my front desk, so I do answer the question of, you know, are all of these real? Um, quite a lot. To which my response tends to be, well. If I let you touch them, I promise they're really there. You know, they are physically real. They're just <laughs> original. Um, and plaster casts are kind of, they're such a strange object in that respect because in our museum collections, any other objects that we had that were, that, you know, we were talking about being 200 odd years old, we'd be considering them really quite precious and deserving of our attention. Mm. And plaster casts don't tend to get, they get a bad rap. So we try to lean in, I suppose to um the complexity of their status because replicas i guess kind of exist betwixt and between don't they they sort of depend upon their original for meaning if they weren't a copy of something then they both wouldn't exist and we wouldn't recognize that they had any value anyway um and at the same time they are independent objects in their own right with their own life and history and in the case of plaster cast they do tend to carry the marks of that history on their very surface because they are remarkably fragile they're heavy not as heavy as marble but it makes them extremely difficult to move but also the slightest little knock and they will tend to lose a little bit in a shower of plaster or worse Um, and they have ours have picked up various graffiti marks and things over time so (laughs) I guess that doesn't help either because it makes them look like they haven't been loved. I don't know. I think we need to find our love again for plaster cast. <laughs> I feel really sorry for them now. <laughs> My poor baby. I have so many babies. <laughs> so what's the future really for um, cl- uh, sort of collections with replicas of classical sculpture? Do you think these sorts of replicas have a still have a place in these collections would you collect things that have been 3d printed or yeah I mean I guess in part it's hard to answer about their future without thinking a little bit about their more recent past because plaster cast as I said they have not fared well and so we are one of very few surviving collections in the UK of of major collections of plaster cast I guess there's us and the V&A and, and the Ashmolean, which are the three kind of major collections that still survive, because lots of plaster cast collections in the course of the 20th century were destroyed, either kind of passively, just through a lack of love and attention being, you know, put into cupboards and forgotten about, um, or my personal favourite, under the bleachers in an American university's um, sports stadium um, <laughs> and just forgotten until they were rediscovered. And, you know, plaster doesn't do well with fluids. Ew. And I imagine there are many fluids <laughs> under the bleachers. Um, <laughs> or, you know, more active modes of destruction. So um, being knocked apart, bashed apart, actively destroyed, pushed off the top of buildings, for instance awful histories um so you know plaster casts and now we're now sort of seeing more of a resurgence so places are rediscovering casts that they'd forgotten they had you know opening cupboards and being like oh gosh look we actually have a plaster cast collection and starting to reinstall them and um give them new love so i think plaster casts themselves both in terms of display and in, in terms of research potential are feeling the love they've suddenly become a little bit more sexy and that can only be a good thing um so on the one hand i think you know at the moment they're not going anywhere hopefully on the other hand you're right there are lots of new technologies aren't there of replication there's 3d imaging technology which sort of allows you to completely control the object and fly over it and do view it from all sorts of angles that you can't really see the original in mm-hmm. and then there's 3D printing. And so that's something I hear a lot, you know, aren't your objects going to be obsolete when it comes to 3D printing? Hasn't 3D printing already made them obsolete? And I think the answer is not yet, actually. And hopefully it won't make them obsolete. It will simply place them in a richer context that will hopefully mean that their value and their historical significance becomes a little bit clearer. And that's because, again, my understanding, I'm would be so happy to be told that I'm wrong on this. My understanding of um, 
the technology at the moment with 3D printing is that it's very much limited by the size of the printer and my objects are very big and you wouldn't be able to print them in one piece and at this stage I think it's a little bit tricky to um, print multiple pieces that need to fit together because because they're liquid layers they have a tendency to sink and that makes it a smidge difficult to predict how well they might fit together at the end but I'd love to be told that I'm wrong on that and that the um, technology has kind of galloped ahead (laughs) so I think you know in a few years I'm sure that it will be possible to order your own five meter tall Samian Kuros for your garden and probably have it (laughs) delivered on next day delivery yeah um but we're not quite there yet and I think that 3D printing will throw up many of the same sorts of issues about being betwixt and between and the nature of the change in medium for instance and how that impacts upon viewing and engagement um, as plaster casts do but at the same time will hopefully lead to a kind of re-evaluation of the relationship between copy and original that will help us to place plaster casts in our collections and in the present. Suzanne Turner, thank you very much for talking to the C Word today. Thank you for having me. And now for some comments, questions and corrections. We've had a very nice email from Naomi, who had a comment regarding freelancing. She writes in, when I first considered going into conservation, I talked to a conservator who had recently retired from the field. And I remember her commenting that there weren't many object conservators going freelance. Not just because of the lack of work, but also because of the cost of supplies. She tried it and found that she was buying new supplies for each project because because of the wide variety of materials she was working with. In comparison to something like paper conservation, we can keep using the same supplies project to project. And um, I think that's a very good point, actually. It is very costly to keep buying all these new supplies for whatever comes up next. Yeah, uh, there could be something in that, Naomi. You're right. And Naomi also writes, uh, this season of the podcast Within the Wires is being done in the style of museum audio tours. While that's not directly related to conservation, it seemed relevant to museum lovers in general. Thanks very much, Naomi. I think I'll check that out. Uh, We'll check a link to it in the show notes. And thanks very much. As always, we love hearing from you. So do please get in touch uh, if you have anything to say to us. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. We're The C Word and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jenna Mathiasen. Join us next time for an episode about communicating conservation. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the C Word Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Diddy Music, used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production.